Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Show. My name is Heike Turciano and I'm your host. And today this gleeful face will be talking about a not so gleeful subject of depression. Um, I'd like to address some uh, facts first of all about depression. It is the most cost rendering disease in the United States of America, cost, costing uh, job loss, uh, oh my gosh, insurance costs, name it, medical costs. It is the most costly disease that we have in this country, believe it or not, above heart attacks and cancer. Um, women are two times more likely to suffer from depression. Uh, and they say the biggest reason has to do with a lot of additional amounts of stresses. And oftentimes uh, they basically say that women just don't get enough uh, healing and feeling time. And so women are twice as likely to suffer uh, from depression. Depression is defined as sadness that persists over a longer period, prolonged period of time, or it just seems to be um, more exaggerated for the actual event that's occurring. So when we look at that then, under no circumstances should the, those types of persistent or over-exaggerated over periods of time of depression be ignored. Because those people who have those lengthy times of depression, one in, out of eight of them commit suicide. So this is something that has to be taken very, very seriously and observed by family members and friends not to be ignored. Um, when we look at symptoms, uh, uh, the ones I have listed up here are the most common symptoms. However, there are other symptoms uh, that are uh, known that you may know personally about the individual. If they start doing things that are not within their normal personality or who and what they do or their activities that they do. Uh, inability to enjoy things, no spark in life, they feel helpless and worthless. Uh, they'll talk themselves down, they'll talk other people down. Uh, they get irritable, they are not able to sleep uh, oftentimes or have a lot of disrupted sleep or they'll sleep through in the middle of the day and not be able to sleep at night. So sleep disturbances, increased anxiety or anxiousness. A drop in sexual drive for, for married adults, uh, we'll see that as well. They just don't have a desire too much for anything other than to focus on what they're depressed about. And sometimes they don't even know what they're depressed about, uh, particularly if it's a physiological cause. Uh, headaches, back aches, digestion issues, or stomach will start to hurt. Because when you're depressed and not feeling well, your body doesn't produce um, adequate amounts of enzymes, certain types of hormones, you don't digest your food well, so oftentimes you don't eat very well when you're depressed, you'll sit there and down the bonbons or something to try and cheer yourself up. Um, because sugars do help cheer you up, but it needs to be the right kind of sugars, and we'll talk about that later on in our discussion. So. These types of things, uh, also to the suicidal thoughts, and oftentimes they'll talk about them or not talk about them, and that's a more difficult thing to detect depending on, on the person, uh, him or herself. The causes, okay. We can look to physiological causes. We know that the uh, neurotransmitter serotonin is primarily the, uh, the main transmitter responsible for mood elevation, making us feel good. There's a lot of other ones as well, but when we look traditionally at depression, we look at serotonin. Now, serotonin is made by the brain, the intestines, and other tissues from an amino acid called tryptophan. And tryptophan is found in various types of foods. And so when people's amino acid ratio um, fluctuates or is not in proper balance, having to do with dietary issues, and they lack tryptophan, they're not able to manufacture serotonin. Um, a deficiency in something called glial, uh, glial cells, or some people pronounce glial cells. Um, these cells are brain cells which are necessary to uh, carry various nu nutrients to the brain. And when there's a lot of inflammation in these glial cells, which are uh, located in the, frontal, the prefrontal cortex of the brain, you're not going to get the nutrients, you're not going to get serotonin, you're not going to get things carried into this frontal cortex, uh, and you're going to get depressed. Uh, inflammation is the primary problem with the glial cells in that um, the blood sugars cause inflammation, food allergies, all these types of things cause these to get, uh, cells to get very inflamed, and then the nutrients can't pass these, the, the, the barriers that are in the brain. Um, 
poor diet and allergies we discussed. That could be food allergies, that can be environmental allergies. They cause us to become very, very, very inflamed. So diagnostically, we need to find out or recognize what foods we're allergic to and avoid them. Uh, or what environmental uh, sparks cause us to have allergic reactions. Avoidance is always better than taking medications in regards to allergies. Uh, always better, particularly with food allergies. Um, nutritional deficiencies. Obviously, if you're lacking certain types of B vitamins, you're not going to manufacture serotonin, B12, folic acid, B6. These are all very, very important B vitamins that are necessary for the manufacture of serotonin and other things as well. Lacking essential fatty acids. 60% of our brain consists of essential fatty acids, DHA and EPA. And if we don't have these adequate amounts of fatty acids, we can't carry the information between our nerves or, uh, and then therefore we can also permeate the cells to deliver those uh, responses. Uh, candida, yeast, the sugar hogs love and are filled most of the time with yeast, also known as candida. There are other forms of candida, multiple forms of candida. But the yeast uh, cause brain fog, they cause inflammation, so the sugars um, that people are eating are causing tremendous amount of inflammation in addition to the food allergies and environmental uh, allergies. Uh, hormones and hormonal fluctuations in the brain. Uh, multitudes of different types of hormones. Thyroid hormone can affect the brain. Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone balances, DHEA. Those hormones are very, very vital for maintaining uh, certain bodily functions that are necessary and therefore can contribute to the brain not working right. Uh, heavy metals, alcohol, <sighs> in the same category because they're both poisons. <laughs> um, heavy metals, mercury, fluoride, uh, the good old fluoride treatments, uh, store in the brain tissue and that was research from World War II that was done and no, you know, fluoride, mercury, heavy metals from computer operations, from pesticide chemicals, all these store in the brain and they cause the brain not to be able to properly rep replicate nerve cells, uh, inflammation, the list goes on and on. Um, certain medications also uh, cause an issue or raise the likelihood of depression. High blood pressure medications, nobody would really tend to think about those, but they do. Certain types, uh, certain antidepressants uh, contribute, and actually there is now warnings on certain antidepressants, antidepressants that actually say that they, the risk of suicide actually increases with these usage, usages of these. Narcotics, antihistamines. Uh, can cause. So the good old, old, remember I mentioned it's best to handle your allergies by elimination and, and other means. The antihistamines really can make uh, problems with the brain and how the brain transfers nutrients and information as well, leading to depression. Cortical steroids, uh, uh, pregnisone, any type of steroidals that are, is used as an anti-inflammatory can lend itself also to depression. Uh, lack of sunlight. There is a disorder called SAD uh, that a lot of people suffer in the winter time because they have a lack of sunlight uh, exposure. So exposing your eyes at least 30 minutes a day to some type of sunlight without the good old sunglasses on is preferred. Sunlight is kind of necessary uh, for human survival and I know most people say avoid the sun at all costs. I understand the sunscreen for most people it is important, but you do require sunlight to stimulate certain types of hormones in the brain in the pituitary. So blood sugar and chemicals we discussed a little earlier. When your blood sugars rise, you become very acidic, you get very inflamed. I know if I've had a weekend vacation where I've had a lot of sugars, I'm a bit dopey the next day. Um, my brain processes don't think as well. I just don't function as well. So keeping those sugars uh, down, and particularly if you have diabetes, is a very, very, very important uh, uh, thing to do. All right, we kind of touched on diet a little bit earlier, but I want to uh, mention it uh, briefly, but it is obviously the most important factor when you're talking about depression, in my personal opinion. Uh, balancing the sugars, particularly 
complex carbohydrates, not sugars, uh, not the junk, not the bag of potato chips, not the cookies. No, we're, we're talking complex carbs, I mean good wholesome vegetables, leafy green vegetables, organic preferably because once again we know that chemicals and chemical allergies are very, very common and increase inflammation and depression as well. Um, good sources of protein. The brain actually requires protein to work and a lot of people are going off to work with that good old bowl of cereal and then they do that quick little muffin for lunch and then they have their dinner and then they wonder why they're depressed. If you don't have adequate amounts of protein, the brain can't do what it needs to do and it will get depressed. So you need to have at least a minimum of three balanced meals per day that have complex carbs, good fats and proteins in them. Better if you can have those four to five meals, but if you can only do the three, keep them balanced. Put some thought into your food, people, because if you don't, when you get to be older and as things grow with time, you'll have more depression, you'll have more potential for Alzheimer's, you'll have more other health issues. This diet issue is the most important thing that I could stress. Um, the things that we know can trigger uh, depression, more so dietary-wise, is sugars, saturated fats, the junk, heavy meat fats, french fry fats, all that kind of stuff. Those saturated fats, the brain gets very, very, very sluggish. And so you don't want it to be that way. You want it to be perky and peppy and moving and doing good. So you need to avoid those trans fats, heavy saturated fats, and keep the sugars down. Uh, avoiding foods that trigger allergic reaction, very, very important, and the chemicals. I found this an interesting fact uh, that my husband had read to me this uh, uh, weekend was in the United States, we have over 1,400 different chemicals that we add to our foods. In Europe, they have four. So the chances of an allergic reaction to chemicals is mind-boggling here in the United States because of all the chemical additives we use to our foods. They're not wholesome, fresh, unprocessed foods. Uh, avoid alcohol. Alcohol is a depressant. It will bring you down. And so avoiding something that brings you down is always the best. Uh, obviously, a nice little half a glass of wine with a meal occasionally is fine. But excessive uses of alcohol is a depressant. So don't use it to pick you up because it ain't going to work. Exercising, getting the circulation going, getting the body going, and later on in the show I'll show you a really good routine you can do to get the brain working and get your body moving and to raise some of those endorphins. Exercise raises a feel-good hormone called endorphins, well, feel-good hormones called endorphins. They make you feel good, give you energy, they make you happy, um, they make you where you need to be. So that exercise in whatever form you choose is very, very, very important. I've listed a series of supplements that I know have very good research, not just here in the States, but in other countries as well. Japanese research, European research, Chinese research, all valid non-pharmaceutical company research. Um, and then my personal experience that I have in operating health food stores, um, I found these right here seem to be some of the most effective ways to do it. We talked about tryptophan earlier as being necessary uh, for the body to manufacture serotonin. If you can't find tryptophan rich foods or don't eat them, you can do tryptophan on an empty stomach a few times a day. 5-HTP uh, is a precursor uh, to tryptophan which can also aid and abed uh, with serotonin production. SAMe. SAMe helps you metabolize the serotonins that you do produce. And then there, there's really good research. We have a few physicians in town that recommend SAMe with very good success. And my fee customer feedback on SAMe to help with depression, phenomenal. Uh, fish oils, great European research. Ginkgo and uh, make serotonin. Oh boy, a good bee complex or a good multiple high uh, in uh, bees. Uh, there is a chemical in the naturopathic arena, arena uh, conversion called BH4 that we know when we're deficient in, um, we get depressed. And so if we can use the bees to help, if you are taking medications, the bees help the medications work better, so hopefully you can use a little lower dosage. Uh, or if you're not taking it, it will help with your depression in conjunction with other types of supplementation and lifestyle changes on the diet. Um, good quality multiple vitamin with calcium magnesium. Calcium magnesium helps things relax, 
helps vasorelax the blood vessels so you can get better blood flow moving. This requires a lot of blood in order to work and if you don't have good circulation to the brain, it ain't going to happen. Uh, cleansing the body of toxins. There are different, uh, I've got, a, I know at my store and there are other places, good whole body cleanses that bottom line will detox the colon, clean out the bowel, get the liver moving, get all the organs moving, clean the blood. And I, I got to tell you, nine times out of ten, my customers come in that do tell me, tell me they feel so significantly better in their brain, in their depression, in their mood. So cleansing and detoxing the body, and there's juicing that you can do to do with that as well. Different formulas you can go online to help with that. There are also various uh, Bach flower essence remedies that work with emotional issues. Uh, most good health food stores have these Bach flower essences and you can look up your various symptoms and maybe try a few of those. Now there are some tests uh, that I'd like to review with that you can discuss with your doctor if you have chronic depression that I'd like you to keep in mind. Testing for yeast, food, and chemical allergies. I have a website on here that your physician can use in order to uh, order these types of tests for you. You can send them off to this company and uh, find out what you're allergic to as far as foods, chemicals, uh, and environmental uh, allergens. Hormone testing, vitamin mineral analysis, anemia can contribute to depression. Toxic metals we discussed earlier amino acid analysis, and blood sugar analysis. All these should be uh, viewed upon as potential for your physician to uh, test you for and see whether or not these may be a contributing factor to depression. All these kinds of things, if at all possible, before you try on the meds. They're very difficult. They take a while for them, the meds to work, and it takes a long time to get off of them if you do go on them. So anyway, we're going to be moving on to our next segment, which is our fitness portion. the fitness portion of our show and today I'm going to show you an exercise that was actually recently on the Montel show uh, Montel's got a terrific doctor by the name of Dr. Schwartz who uh, this is to get the blood flowing and circulating and instead of using caffeine can give you about 30 minutes worth of energy first we start with just some light weights or no weight at all one or two pounders I didn't have those at home I've got the five pounders a little heavy but I'm going to show you these four different exercises that you can do you do 15 and we want to do them nice and quick and if you have any types of elbow injuries or bicep injuries um, this is not a recommended exercise for you um, be aware obviously before you start a fitness program you want to consult your doctor or healthcare professional so 15 here and then we switch over and we're going to kick back like this and we're just going to do those nice and quick and fast trying to get circulation going into the triceps okay just a quick 15 reps on that one okay then overhead we're going to reach above to the sky and you're just going to do quick real quick right here 15 reps keeping the heart moving and you're breathing hopefully you're still breathing <laughs> if you're that out of shape then you need more practice that's just all there's to it Okay, and the last one, we're going to swing. And I don't know how good this is going to work with my microphone, so I'm going to kind of do this a little slower. But you're going to twist around. Mind you, if you have any back injuries, you know, bruised um, ribs or anything like that, this is probably not an exercise for you. But you can do it slower or faster, depending on your pace, getting the circulation moving again in the body. 15 reps on each side. So what we'd like you to do then Give that a try. See if that can't take the place of maybe that burst of uh, caffeine in the afternoon for some additional amount of energy. Next, we're going to be moving on to our research analyst for the latest, greatest info. Hi, 
welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us today is research analyst Ralph Turciano. Thank you. What if I told you you could take a drug, medicine, nutritional supplement, or anything for that matter that could reduce your risk of disability down by 41%? Well, you can. It's available to you on a daily basis. It's something simple just called walking. Out of the Journal of Geriatric Physical Therapy, they found out that those that walk just 40 minutes a day reduce their risk of disability down by a total, as I said before, 41%. And this was just over a four-month period of time. Now, they had a control group, which was interesting. The control group did nothing for four months literally saw a decline of 9% in their aerobic capacity, part of their ability to breathe, while that walking group increased their aerobic capacity by 19%. It doesn't take a little to do a lot. It doesn't have to come out of a pill. This is a simple fix that anyone can do. Just 40 minutes. Now, on to our food. Now, sometimes you think because people manufacture food for children, that children by some odd chance would be end up eating a little healthier. If they make health-related claims, saying this food is good for your child, you'd believe, you'd believe so. Well, they discovered that 89% of the food manufactured for children, and this is excluding soda, bakery goods, and candies. These are not part of the picture. 89% of the food manufactured from children had virtually no nutritional value whatsoever and was loaded with sugar. Now, here's the criminal part. Of that 89%, 62% of those foods made claims that they were healthy for your children. When in reality, there was no health benefit whatsoever. And of all, of all the food they researched manufactured for children, only 11%. And this came out of the journal, the July issue of the UK-based Journal of Obesity Review. So when you think about these companies manufacturing food for your kids, don't think that they have the best interest of your child in mind. It's the bottom line of the dollar on this one. If they can get them to eat it regardless of what it's made of, they'll do it. Now, back to this. Well, let's say, for example, what would you do or what would you think if you can choose the sex of your child? Boy, girl, maybe both at the same time? Well, through the miracle of PCBs, what I call polychlorinated chlorinated biophenol, biphenols, they discovered this. For every milligram or microgram of PCB found in the blood of women, it reduced the chance of having a boy down by 7%. The maximum levels they discovered in children, and this was done through the San Francisco Bay Area by the, environment, the Journal of Environmental Health, uh, Biomed Central Journal of Environmental Health. They found that uh, basically the woman with the highest levels of PCBs had a 33% less likelihood of having a male child. Mm -hmm. That just to give you an idea of how powerful an environmental toxin is that's still around to this day, even though it was banned in the 70s. And they did this on children, uh, mothers who were basically born in the 50s and 60s themselves. Again, very intriguing. Now, here's a little twist. There used to be a bacteria which was found virtually universally in everyone that was born for the past 50,000 years, which was very important. Now keep that in mind because they were trying to figure out why asthma rates were beginning to skyrocket within the past few decades. Well, Heliopactor pylori, they discovered, reduced the risk of children having asthma by up to 59%. And in teens who had Heliopactor pylori, their chance of having asthma 25% likely. Also, 40% less likely to have hay fever, allergies, eczema, or rash. This was done at the New York University Medical Center Research. And on top of that, they noticed that basically that today, as of, well, I should say of 1990, when it was almost universal among all children to have heliopractic pylori in their guts, only 5.4% of children of prior to the age of three had any H. pylori remaining. Now, H. pylori is always known as a bacteria that causes ulcers, but as a child, those acids can be kind of weak, and as an adult, balance becomes to come into play. So that's something real interesting. In fact, this is how they said it worked. Our hypothesis is that if you have heliopactic bacteria, you have a greater population of what's called regulatory T cells that are setting higher thresholds for sensitization, Dr. Blazer explained. For example, if a child does not have heliopactor 
and has contact with two or three cockroaches, sounds gross, he may get sensitized to them. But if Heliobacter is directing the immune response that even if a child comes into contact with many of these bugs, he may not get sensitized because the immune system is more tolerant to that. And you have to remember, as little as two generations ago, it was at least 70% in all children. Now it's down to 5.4%. And now here's a little vindication for the old low-carb diets that we spent so much time trying to crucify, so to say. They discovered with low-carb diets and cholesterol compared to Mediterranean diets and the popular low-fat diets, the best results were with low-carb diets, which were unrestricted in the amount of fats that were that were taken in. This is real interesting because the American Heart Association for the longest period of time has been saying it does not work. They found out that the low carb diets, or I should say high fat low carb diets, resulted in better ratios of HDL to LDL than any other diet that was out there. And this diet lasted two years and they had an 85% adherence rate to the diet. In fact, many of them still fall into this diet today. This research you can find in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they found it to be one of the most credible research studies that were out there. And also at the same time too, you go, well, they must have ate other things while they were on this diet. Nope. This was an isolated nuclear research facility in Israel, which they followed them for at least two years. And basically they found out, without a doubt, including weight loss, that people on the low carbohydrate diets lost 10.3 pounds after on average, where basically the low fat diets only lost six and a half pounds total. They found it incredibly amazing, but yet the American Heart Association responded by calling it null and void, not paying attention to the facts, not paying attention to the science. Well, there's propaganda in the science, and maybe it's all that margarine that's still clouding their thought after all these years. Oh, that was a big one or two. Well, thank you very much. And that's it for this research section. Um, once again, we hope that our show encourages you to do your further research and, and think really about your diet and what you're doing with your lifestyle. Really, really, really important that you take a peek at all of these factors and then read the research for yourself. Go on websites and get information. Take your health into your own hands. Thank you very much for joining our show. Bye.